Hey, it's Jag with an important time-sensitive message. The current staff at Z89 needs your help. The university did not approve funding to the sports staff for expenses for traveling to away games this year. Now, the current exec staff was able to sign up for a university-sanctioned crowdfunding campaign, and they need your help. Cutting the budget for away games cuts opportunities for reps for all the students looking to do play-by-play, studio hosting, and production. Any amount makes a difference as they figure things out going into this year's women's basketball season. To help, visit bit.ly slash helpz89 sports and scroll down to WJPZ. Again, the bit.ly link is bit.ly slash helpz89 sports, or just click the link in today's show notes. For half a century, WJPZ Syracuse has been the greatest media classroom on the planet. We've trained students from the 1970s to the 2020s on how to run a professional radio station. But the lessons learned and relationships formed go far beyond studios and transmitters. Taking a look back through the eyes of those who experienced it. This is WJPZ at 50. Welcome to WJPZ at 50. I am John Jagay, joined today from the class of 1996, Mr. Kefele Kafani. Welcome to the show. Why, thank you, Jag. I'm so happy to be here. I've been looking forward to having you on for a while. We have a lot to cover, but I'll start with you where we start with everybody, which is how you find out about Syracuse, get to campus, and then find out about the radio station. Sure. So it was funny. When it was time for college, I'm from Long Island, and I swore up and down that I was not going to school in New York. So I was going to go somewhere else, far, far away to escape. And I lived up the street from Nassau Coliseum. Mm Mm-hmm. And that's where they had like these huge college fairs. And I swear, I probably signed up with every school that was there. So I was receiving mail and mail and mail and mail. And eventually I got something from Syracuse. And I was like, huh, okay, this looks like an interesting place. And in going through one of the brochures, there's this picture of Dr. Wright in the (laughs) station. Yes. Um, You know this one, right? And uh, it's like he's in the station. You can see all the radio equipment. There's a little placard behind him says that burning up is the Madonna hot song of the day. Yep. And, you know, I was just like, okay, this is the place for me because right before I think it was junior high, my television died and it was the summer. Uh Uh-huh. And my mother absolutely refused to buy a new television. (laughs) And so I'm like home all summer with nothing to do. And that's sort of when I fell in love with radio. I uh, started listening to like Z100 uh, in the morning show. So I thought that growing up, me and one of my friends, we were going to wake up New York mm-hmm. as host of a morning show. So having that that at Syracuse was what really attracted me there. I had never visited campus before I went. Okay. So I went to a presentation at the Marriott, also up the street from my house, next to the Coliseum. Mm-hmm. So did that whole thing. And I saw the presentation and everything. I don't think they showed snow. <laughs> they never do. They never they do. They never do. <laughs> and I was like, okay, this is the one. And my mother was like, okay, well, if this is the one, let's go. Let's do it. Let's get this over with. So I applied early decision. Wow. So I found out by like December that I was in and I did not want to do any more college applications. <laughs> so that was the only school I had applied to. It was the only one I got into. Wow. Yeah. So... Hindsight 2020, I probably should have applied to a few more schools, but no, but I don't regret it, really. Cause... Yeah, it's funny. We've had people on the podcast say, oh, I knew the second I set foot on campus. You knew without even setting foot on campus. Never set foot on campus. <laughs> Never. So you get to the Hill, and thanks to the brochure and Dr. Wright, you already know about WJPZ before you even set foot on campus. So when did you walk into the radio station? So here's what's funny. I applied to Newhouse got deferred. So I went into arts and sciences uh, because I wanted to duel in like English and communication. So I got into arts and sciences and I was doing a summer program and I knew there was a radio station, but I didn't know specifically which station it was. Okay. Yep. So, you know, I'm managing around, we lived in Haven Mm -hmm. for the summer program and I'm from New York. So I'm trying to find like music that I would listen to at home. And really wasn't finding anything. But there was this little static station that I found at the beginning of the dial. And this is old school where there was a real dial, you remember. Yep, yep, yep. You could not touch it for fear that you would not get a signal again, depending on where you were. You couldn't sneeze because if you got that to 89.2 or 89.0, that wasn't happening. Staticky, staticky. 
So there was the station, but I liked the music. Uh, but it was weird. It was a lot of dead air. The DJs weren't very good. And I was like, how is this on the air? But the music is good. And I came to find out that it was Z89. It's the station in the summer when all of the students are gone. So we're sort oh, of right. picking up, you know, high school folks, people who've never been on the air and are in slots that they probably shouldn't be in <laughs> because someone <laughs> needs to be on the air. Right. And, you know, one of my friends told me, oh, that's the campus station. I was like, what? So I called over. And I spoke to someone and I was like, you know, I'm going to be a student in the fall. I'm really interested in joining the station. And they were like, OK, great. Somebody will be in touch. And I was hanging out at the front desk and somebody walked over looking for me. And I was like, that's me. Because I was like, who is this person looking for me? And it was Kim Sykes. Mm -hmm. And she handed me a letter and it was like a welcome letter. So, hey, thanks for your interest in uh, WJPZ. We'll do a fall recruitment. At this day, come here and we'd love to have you. Wow. I know, like, right? And so from that moment on, that is why she is one of my faves. So that sort of touch. And then when it came to the fall, I was there. I was ready for the big job meetings, ready to take the test, uh, pass the test, thank God. <laughs> uh, was ready to go on air. I think I had a two to four shift. Yep. Because uh, I would not have made it through a four to six. You wouldn't think there's that much difference between two to four and four to six, but there's a big difference. Well, you can stay awake for the two o'clock. Right. You can't stay awake for four. Right. Like you were sleeping, you're out. Hopefully your roommate wakes you up to get you there in time. But I had a two to four, which was, thank goodness, uh, it was awful. I went through many a name change. So I think when I started, I couldn't use Kefele because clearly no one knows how to pronounce that. <laughs> so I... Absolutely had to go with a different name. So I think I started out as KJ Spida, <laughs> which was awful. And that luckily did not make it out of overnight. Okay. So then when I went, uh, moved into middays, I went with the more work-friendly KJ Steele. All right. And stuck with that one for the remainder of my time on the air. That's got a nice ring to it. Yeah, I liked it. Steel with an E at the end. Yes, that's important to differentiate. Mm. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so was it mainly on air, Kefele, or what else did you, were you involved with the radio station? First, I was on air. And back at that time, I think we had a, a number of like powerhouse women who were on uh, the exec team at that point. So you had then Sharon Goodman, now Sharon Michaels, who was in charge of public relations. Mm -hmm. She is like the sun <laughs> and like everything is attracted towards her. And she just like the sweetest, yes. most welcoming and like, all you want to do is go be hugged. And she was BB at the time. Like, you just wanted to be in BB's like area to be hugged, to be called booby. Like, <laughs> so she was in charge of PR. Uh, so you really wanted to be near that energy. Betty Kesson was in public relations. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Jeannie Shad was doing promotions. And Tina was doing production. So I did a little production, promotions little bit of public service and just sort of wanting to get involved in those. So I was doing a lot of contest hours. Mm -hmm. In those days, we were giving away a cassette or CD of your choice. Nice. Back when there was a choice between a cassette or a CD. <laughs> and then we used to have uh, Hoyt's Cinema Passes. Yep. Which we literally were printing like fake money. <laughs> um, it was it was it was awful. We would just have this like template. And just run it on Z89 letterhead, just printing them like it was going out of style. They all worked. They, they, they were accepted on the letterhead all the time, right? Yeah. It worked. So it was good for two people. There you go. <laughs> with out of control. So I did a lot of contest hours with promotions. I'm trying to go to events, just really wanting to be in the station all the time. Uh, I think in production... I was Dion's producer on the Power 30 countdown, mm -hmm. which was really just sort of these are the top three songs, which pretty much for the entirety of my time. Oh, gosh, it was a combination. I think it was between Boys to Men, End of the Road and like Whitney Houston. I will always love you. Knowing Dion's affinity for Whitney Houston, that's not surprising. So this is like weeks in a row. I didn't have to change it. It was the same three songs <laughs> in like three, two and one. So I did a little bit of that. And what else? Those are the big things that I was doing. So you as class of 96, you came in and you mentioned the powerhouse women that were there ahead of you. Yeah. The class of 95 is just so well representative in the Alumni Association, not to mention so many great alums from, you know, 94, 93 as well. 
and you mentioned, of course, Dion. Who are some of the other names that you haven't mentioned yet that you quickly connected with at the radio station? There were so many. So we had Marvin Nugent, yep. uh, a.k.a. The Big Daddy, uh, was a big influence. Kurt Screen, who was Danny Cagney. They did Saturday Night Dance Jam. Yep. So they were pretty big in my life while I was there. You know, the big thing that you want to do, because you, you want to spend as much time in the station as you possibly can, as much time on air as you possibly can. And I came back up for Christmas. So I went home for Christmas and came back right after. Oh, wow. Because, you know, the station was yours. Yes. Like you could be on the air for hours upon hours and just get your air check tapes and, and do that. So we came back up. I stayed with Curtis and Marvin in their South Campus apartment uh, and was just on the air all over the break. Uh, so those folks were big in my life. Who else was there? I mean, I caught the the tail end of Dave Gorab. Yep. You know, Beth Russell at the time. So all of these folks who were just like out here knocking it out the park, I think were there. So I think we were a pretty golden age mm -hmm. of the station. That was when we had switched our format a little bit to, it was like a rhythmic CHR with an urban slant. Okay. And so at that point in the 90s, you know, you had TLC, you had Arrested Development. Who else were we playing? We were playing Brandy yep. was everywhere. So there's a lot of Brandy. So there was a lot of popular stuff that we were sort of playing that not a lot of other people were playing as well. So I think that was a nice differentiation in the market for us and what was really one of the fun things. And it was the music that I wanted to listen to. It was also sort of when, during our time, that's when Hot 97 switched from dance to hip hop. Okay. And we had a pretty nice connection to Hot 97 because of Rocco. Right. So, you know, he was very gracious and like they had Hot Night uh, and he would give us tickets, which they were giving away like millions of tickets. We had like two. <laughs> and that was like a whole promotion. And you would have thought that we were giving away the world uh, the way we promoted that. I was there during the period where we gave away the car. Mm -hmm. So we were doing a lot at that time. I think we were feeling about as professional as we could be with still being where we were, both with age, with experience and all of that. So we really felt like we were running a professional station. And I think that probably shows here we are, you know, 30 years later and so many of the folks from your era are so well connected mm -hmm. to the radio station. I think that probably speaks to the shared experience that you all had there where you were just together 24 seven and accomplishing such great things in the 90s. It really was a special time for the radio station. Mm -hmm. So let's go through your career after Syracuse Cafele. So you've had quite the journey uh, since graduation. So take us through it. I think originally I thought I was going to stay in media. So my undergrad was in marketing because I was in school of management and then went to Michigan State for grad school mm -hmm. for a degree in advertising. And I was in advertising for about three years after. Uh, so I started out at Ogilvy and Mather. I worked in the account side on brands like Cotton Incorporated, Hershey, mm -hmm. uh, and then pharmaceuticals and the dot-coms were a big part of that. Uh, so we know where this story is going, uh, which is down in flames. Uh, so I, I was in New York for the first two and a half years. And it was funny because we were losing people left and right to the dot-coms. Yeah. Like people were like doubling and tripling their salaries to go to like a dot-com. And I'm sitting there in the agency like, what about me? But then they all lost their jobs and their you know, dot coms all went under. They, that bubble burst right at the turn of the century, right? That bubble burst quite nicely, yeah. And then also uh, the economy sort of tanked when I had moved to Los Angeles. So I had just moved and the company that I was working for had a very small piece of business from Quaker. Uh, Quaker got bought by Pepsi. Mm -hmm. The worst thing in a merger is what happens to your ad agencies, especially if you have, you know, more than one. <laughs> uh, and they had three. And I was like, well, I know who's not going to win this one. And it was mine. So I decided to figure out something else to do with my life so I would not be homeless and unemployed, having just moved to Los Angeles, mm -hmm. which was rough. So I think I was like couch surfing on Adam Eisenberg's couch. And he was done with me after about a week. <laughs> um, so because he would be like, so how's that uh, apartment housing going? And I was like, what? Yeah, when are you leaving? Oh, okay. No, so um, <laughs> so I had found a job in advertising, but that was again, had my own place finally, and then the market was going to take, I was going to lose my job again. 
And I was like, I can't do that. I can't do it. So I went back into higher ed because in the undergrad, I'd been an RA. I had also done that in grad school. So I became a resident director at Loyola Marymount University. I thought that would be like two years while I figured out what I wanted to do. And then we're now about 22 years later uh, that I'm still working in higher education. Essentially, like, as you know, it is college all the time. Yeah. Working with students, working with student organizations, uh, serving as an advisor, helping folks with different issues when they're falling into crisis. So I've worked in residence life, in orientation. Most recently, I was the dean of students for one of the undergraduate colleges at UC San Diego. Uh, have been since doing some diversity work, so sort of uh, consulting. Uh, so did some consulting work at another college, and I also do that for a market research company every day. What is it about the higher ed space that once you got back into it, you said you thought it'd be two years and now it's been two decades. What is it about that space that's so appealing to you? I think one, working with students keeps you young. Uh, so I continually forget how old I am. Okay. Because I'm hanging out with, you know, not hanging out, but interacting the vast majority of my day with 18 to 24 year olds. Okay. And so I'm not looking in a mirror. So I'm like, I'm only 27. <laughs> so that keeps you young. Um, Doing the work, you know, day in and day out, I'm helping someone graduate from college. Yeah. I feel like that was an experience for me that was transformative. I think higher education has that opportunity for folks that hopefully you're not just going to class and that's it. I think the experiences that I had outside of the classroom were equally as valuable as what I got in the classroom. Yes. I joke of my first job, actually, when I got the job at Ogilvy, I was referred by another Z89 person who also made like $1,000. And mind you, in 1998, $1,000 referral bonus is pretty freaking sweet. Yes. So that happened. Uh, so that was my first job was through uh, a connection from Z89. And it's always been about like, so most of the successful job that I've had have been a referral uh, through somebody who I've known. Mm -hmm. I joke, if someone refers me to a job, I do great. If I do it on my own, fails miserably. Uh, <laughs> so I have to make sure I only take jobs where I'm referred by someone that I know. I mean, and that's just a valuable lesson. That's something they drill into our heads at Newhouse and at Syracuse mm -hmm. Network, 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 Network. And I mean, I don't want to give the station all the credit here, but having such a positive experience at Syracuse and at JPZ and you wanting to pay that forward so that students today have a, such a similar experience in higher education, that really says a lot about your time at the station. I mean, the station was like second home. Yeah. So we didn't have cell phones. Right. Or the cell phones the way we have them. We had cell phones, but they were the... You know, the Zach Morris in the a Zach bag. Zach Morris yeah. brick. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, oh, gosh, you, the things that we had to do when we did a live broadcast. So we had like two bricks. So we had the brick phone and then we had this other like it was in a crate, like a wooden crate. I forgot what it's called. Was but, it a Marty? Uh, no, it wasn't. I don't think it was a Marty. Comrex? It was like, I think it was a Comrex. Yep. Yeah. So we had to carry this and the cell phone to do a live broadcast, which was awful. And you didn't have that. At one point, we got pagers. Mm -hmm. uh, so somebody had negotiated a pager contract and we got, say, 10 pagers. And the finagling that people did to get a pager was out of control. And the shenanigans that we would do to get a pager. Yeah, somebody had a, a certain number on a pager. Right? Somebody told me about it at one point. Do you remember who that was? Um, AC Corrales. I don't remember what the, I mean, it was 315, whatever the three digits were. But then it was ACAC. -A -C. Okay, that's right. So he definitely uh, put that out there all the time and loved that. But I think I got the pager one summer when I was doing ops. Uh, and I was like, ooh, I've got the pager. <laughs> Pager's the worst. Because what are you going to do? I don't have a phone. So like he pays me now. I got to go find a pay phone. Right. Yeah, I'll see you when I get back to the station. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, but when you were looking for someone, you would call their room first. Mm-hmm. They weren't there. You check the station. They weren't at the station. You check Kimmel. Right. They weren't at Kimmel. You're like, I'm not going any further than this. <laughs> uh, but most of us were in one of those three places. Right. So, or if you stayed around long enough, we would get there. Any other funny stories from your time at the station, Kefele, that come to mind? Uh, just moments you, you go back to a banquet and you're like, remember the time when? There were many times. Um, I was the king of the crazy idea. So one year we were doing a fundraiser for Ronald McDonald House. So we had done it 
in the previous year at Carousel. And we raised a lot of money. It was great. Uh, it's called Coins for Kids, right? And we were going to do it again. And I said, well, I can't just go to one mall. I'm going to go to three. Uh, because this was the year that NBC had decided that they were going to broadcast the Olympics on like multiple venues. Okay. Uh, and remember, they called it the triple cast. And so I had Coins for Kids, the triple cast. Yes. Uh, so we had, so Neon Beyond, you know, flagship DJ at the time was at Carousel. Yep. So he was at the main mall. Uh, Chris Villardi, then known as Christian Quinn. Right. I think I sent him to like Camillus. Uh, and I think Marvin, who was Big Daddy, or it may have been one of the, it might have been one of the women, it might have been like a Gina Jones or uh, Joanna, were at uh, Shopping Town. Yep. <laughs> and so we had each of them at a different mall collecting the money, mm -hmm. you know, going back and forth uh, through the different, you know, talks. Uh, and talks up and we did pretty good. I don't even remember how much money we raised, but one of the venues gave us all the money from their fountain. Oh, cool. Oh, yeah. That's cool until you have to carry like 17 of those little like Home Depot buckets of coins <laughs> back. And then they're just sitting in the station because I'm like, are we going to have to roll these? Like we have to convert these coins into cash. So I'm pretty sure I just gave them to the people at Ronald McDonald House and I was like, good luck. <laughs> and they figured it out uh, with what they were going to do. But that was one of my favorites. There was another time, one of the big things, a lot of the folks who were on air were also on air professionally. And so if you were lucky, you were in Syracuse. So a lot of people were like on Y94. Yeah. Uh, but then there were a couple of people who had to go to Utica, but they were on the air and they were really on the air. Mm -hmm. And we would go down to visit. And I feel like we were visiting Damien at a station in Utica. And there were too many of us in the car because it was me, Dion, Adam, Marvin, uh, Melanie and Carrie. Uh, <laughs> way too many people and not that big of a car. Okay. And mind you, one of the people in the car is called Big Daddy. Okay. Right. So we're like squeezed into the back of Adam's car, which has tried to kill me on more than one occasion. <laughs> and... We were going somewhere. Like, we were trying to do a curve. We hit the curve too hard, too fast, too fat, and we slid <laughs> down into a ditch. And we're like, oh, my God. Like, how are we going to get out of this? Like, literally can't get out of this ditch. And it was one of those things where we're like, okay, well, we need to go get help. And so I was like, we could go to a house. And, like, me, Marvin, and Dion are black. We're like, we're not doing it uh, because we're not going to get shot in the middle of Utica. Uh, so one of y'all is going to have to go to the house and ask for some help for a tow truck. But eventually we did. We got a tow truck and got out of the ditch and then drove silently home, having our life having flashed before us oh, um, <laughs> at that time. So that was fun. But we would do stupid things like that all the time. Uh, so you're always going to visit someone at a station. Spending a lot, a lot, a lot of time there and together. So it really did forge a lot of relationships and a lot of closeness during that time. It's one of my more valuable experiences from undergrad. I mean, again, why else would I ever, I live in Southern California. Why would I ever go back to Syracuse, especially in the winter? Because you're in San Diego now. It's the polar opposite weather-wise of Syracuse. Oh, yeah. So why would I ever, like, I go back because of the station, because of those connections uh, and to see those folks. You may have more letters after your name than uh, almost anybody there at this point with all the degrees and certifications you have. But yes. But you don't use them all. <laughs> you know, they're there, but you don't have to use them. You've been a dean of students. You've got all these degrees. You've spent so much time in higher education helping future generations have the experience that you did or something similar. I do want to ask you also about the adoption process. This is something you talked about sure. on social media. And take us through that. That's something that we haven't really talked about in the podcast before. Mm -hmm. So I was in New York for a short period of time. I mean, I've been in California pretty much for the last 20 years. But there was a stint where I went back to New York mm -hmm. for a job. And while I was there... My best friend's a social worker, and she was on the train, and she knows I want to have kids, but biological kids are expensive for gay folk, and gay men more specifically, because sure, I only have half the ingredient and not the useful one. Um, <laughs> so, you know, like, I don't have the oven, I don't have the eggs, I got nothing. <laughs> so, you know, they were talking about fostering uh, and adoption through foster care, uh, and 
she sent a sign that basically said, single, we don't care. Uh, gay, we don't care. Serial killer, we can only care a little bit. Don't kill the child. <laughs> but um, it was basically, we don't care who you are as long as you can provide a loving home like we want you. So I, I've gone through this process of becoming a foster parent and was like, yay, let's do it. Um, so went through this whole process in New York. Great, was ready to go. Then I got a job in San Diego and I was like, Ugh. so I moved out here and I was like, hey, can I get transfer credits? Uh, you know, <laughs> and they were like, no. So I had to go through the whole process again here in San Diego. So I'm like a super certified foster parent. I finished my training and I want to say it was like in July and I was homesick one day in August. And I remember I was sick because I am the worst sick person. I'm useless. I want to cry. I want my mother. You have the man cold. I have a man cold. Uh, don't talk to me. All I want is my orange juice, my ginger ale, uh, some crackers and soup. <laughs> so I was in a delirium and they called and they said, hey, I think we have a match for you. And I was like, OK. And they were like, he's a 15 year old who's eligible for adoption. Uh, so I knew this going in and I was like, OK, we were supposed to have a process. Like, I think this was a Thursday, Friday. They give you I was going to come in and they would give you like a history mm -hmm. uh, and tell a little bit about him. On Monday, we were supposed to meet like him and I. Tuesday, I was going to like meet the family that he was in. And then Wednesday, we were like going to maybe have like a one on one, go to dinner or do something like that. And then possibly he could move on Thursday or Friday of the following week. Wow. That, yeah. So, and that's still a quick process. Uh, so on Monday, I was like ready to do the first meet. And they were like, yeah, so um, things are moving a little bit faster than we need. We need him to move in today. And I was Ooh. like, wait, what? Yeah. Uh, and I was like, I don't understand what is happening. You know, so I meet him. I don't know what he looks like, anything. You know, I have all these expectations. I think he'll probably be black, fine, whatever, like five, nine, what? I don't know. All these images I haven't had, but what showed up was like a 6'3 white boy with a Starbucks, which should have been my first clue that he was going to be trouble because any kid <laughs> that shows up with a Starbucks, no, um, <laughs> like that's going to be a problem. And so he showed up and I was like, OK, hi. And he's like, hi. And I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. And like we go through all of this stuff. So luckily I have a job with a very generous uh, parental leave policy. So I was able to take some time off. So I took about a month off uh, before school started mm -hmm. so that we could get to know each other and get acclimated. And uh, so we got to, you know, spent a lot of time together, got to know each other, got him enrolled in school. And then uh, I think in November, I had to go back to the city for a wedding. And I still wasn't, you know, fully engaged in like, I'm like, I would think I'm a parent. I might be a parent. I don't know what this is about. And we're walking through Times Square uh, because clearly you have to take everyone through Times Square. Uh, he absolutely bumped into this guy. And the guy was like, hey, man, what's going on? And he's like, oh, sorry, it was my bad, you know, apologize. And this guy was still like coming at him. Now, mind you, he's 6'3". I'm not. I'm like six feet, but whatever. And, you know, with the height, I think he looks older than he is. Yeah. Uh, so this man, I think, was ready to fight. And I'm th here thinking, do I know how to fight? I don't know how to fight, but <laughs> like this man might like attack my kid. So now I'm going to have to like fight this man in the middle of the city and I'm ready. Like, you know. Oh, the adrenaline's going. Yeah. Like, the yeah. adrenaline's going. Like I've got like that dad, like I could lift the car up off and throw it up and like, ah! and you know, luckily the man went away, but then I was like, oh, and it was that moment that I was like, okay, I'm a father. This is my kid. Like we're in it. Wow. So <laughs> yeah. Thanks, New York. Uh, so that was sort of that situation where I was like, OK, and, you know, we uh, he was with me for about a year. Uh, I was able to adopt him the following year. Mm -hmm. uh, and I always feel like it's only yesterday, uh, but he is uh, 23. So <laughs> okay. this has been, yeah, a long, long time of doing this. And it's been it's been a fun journey. Um, so, like, you know, it's weird. Like, you remember, like, the first time, like, calls you dad. Yeah. Or like referred to you as dad. And I'm like, yeah, because clearly I was eavesdropping because he was in the bathroom talking to his friends. Because uh, I'm always <laughs> like, he was in the phone. And I was like, you know, anytime you're in the bathroom, I was like, don't be taking pictures, you know, of your junk in there. Um, <laughs> so, and he's like, oh my God, my dad's like, don't take pictures of your junk. Uh, and I was like, ooh. So, you know, it's all of those sort of little things. Like, 
being able to get to celebrate Father's yeah. Day. Yeah. Um, it's super nice, even though it really is me buying my own gifts uh, and just making him reimburse me for them. Uh, <laughs> hey, that's efficient and that's smart. You know, you don't want a bunch of ties. Who wears a tie anymore? I get what I want. And so it really works out that way. But it's been quite the journey. And parenting is like a lot harder than one would think. Yeah. Way too hard. But also, you know, I think when you sort of see the fruits of your labor or they pick up something that you've done or, you know, read back something that you've taught them that they've picked up has been been nice. But I think I'm still in the fertile plane. Like, I don't think I get the return on my investment till 25. So I get little bits and pieces here and there, but it's still been a good thing. Uh, and, you know, when you're working with kids in the foster care system, it's always a hard, hard thing because, you know, they're coming into your life, one with a lot of things you don't know. Right. Because like, you know, if you've raised your kid and you've been together, you know, sort of like the key points. Um, but you, you like drive around and you get like bombs dropped on you all the time. Wow. Like he was my first and adopted him, but I still foster. And so like with other kids, you'll be driving around and they'll be like, oh, I used to live there and they used to beat me. And I'm like, what? Oh, jeez. Or, you know, this is where I was when I was homeless. It's like you get crazy like story that you just don't know uh and they'll just like drop a bomb on you you'll be on the couch like watching a movie and you'll be like yeah this is when xyz happened and you're like calling your therapist because you'd like need to reprocess what you just heard but most of the kids don't do anything to be put into foster care it's sort of a circumstance of their their life experience and uh, you just got to love them and try and do your best uh, make them feel welcome. Cause it was funny. Like he used to wear a lot of college jerseys. So clearly I tried to like sneak a Syracuse one in there and he would never wear it. And I was really? like, wow. Yeah. I was like, you'll wear everything else, but not that one. I see it. Okay. But <laughs> it was hurtful. I, I, yeah. I can see how it would be. I can absolutely see how that would be. Look, you are somebody, Kefele, who is so widely and, and highly regarded amongst your peers and amongst the Alumni Association. The fact that you've donated so much of your time and your professional life, both to students in the secondary space, but then also with adopting and fostering, really speaks to you and your character. And, and I can't thank you enough for coming on today and spending a few minutes with us. It has been my absolute pleasure. Kefele, before I let you go, some of your classmates, Dion, Adam, and others have talked about race at WJPZ at the time you were there. I just wanted to ask you your perspective on things looking back years later. We were definitely moving in a more urban slant. So it was a little bit heavier R&B, a little bit heavier hip hop. Yeah. And again, only folks who are really doing that, I think in our market, definitely on the FM side. And that's where the culture was going. Right. As well. You know, right now, when I listen to like some of the 90s stations, like that was all our playlist. Oh, yeah. Like that was all C89 at the time. So we were doing that. And regardless of the music that we were playing, um, there's always, well, let's start with the thing that race, we're in the ISA, so race undercuts everything. So that's our original sin. And that's going to be something that's always going to play out. I think it played out sort of in the station with preferences or what kind of music people would prefer to hear. But again, all of the folks who were programming at that time were within that vein and appreciated and were able to program us to the best of that. Because I think we went from Dion as music director and PD, then he swapped with Melanie and Melanie became PD and he became MD. Mm -hmm. And then the following year, I want to say Jeff was the PD, but Monica was the music director. Okay. And throughout those years, I think we had built strong relationships with the record reps with that. So we were able, would have been able to sort of continue that. But then midway through my senior year, uh, that's when we had the pulse. Mm -hmm. So that sort of took everything in a totally different direction. And I think that was sort of some of the pushback because uh, alternative, again, if you could uh, go to the complete opposite side of a pendulum. Yeah. From urban, you would find yourself an alternative. And that's, I think, what happened. Now, I also think we did lose because when 95 left, that took a lot of people with them. So that, that was Dion, Marvin, Curtis. I think by the time we got to the fall, you know, AC had left, like a bunch of folks had left the station. And 
there was sort of a cultural vacuum, I guess, that was left, uh, which probably could have been nurtured or developed in time. But I think, I don't know if we knew how to do that as well as we could have, because I think at that time, if you didn't have quote unquote experience or you hadn't spent enough time in the station or you weren't well enough known within the station or trusted by folks, or even if you were known and trusted, sometimes people wouldn't get positions. Whereas we're an educational, I can say this now in hindsight, looking back and doing the work that I do, uh, there were a lot of times that positions went unfilled that could have been filled by someone. Okay. And just because they didn't have all of the skills that were necessary didn't mean that they could not have learned that or we couldn't have developed that. Now, sometimes we didn't have people to develop them. And I think, again, hindsight being 2020, that might have been a situation where we might have been able to lean on our alumni a little bit more to sort of help out with that, where we did have some of the deficiencies or to help train someone up into doing doing this work that we didn't necessarily do at that time. But again, this is all in hindsight. And I wanted to ask you about it, given your current roles and everything you do in the DEI mm -hmm. space. That's, I guess, kind of curious for your perspective on it looking back years later. I think there was a lot of that, that we weren't looking um, or able to have those conversations about who was represented on staff. Yeah. What were the demographics of the station staff? Because I think at the time we would have said, well, anybody who wants to come in, you just have to come in and put the time and put the effort in. But you also have to note that that space has to be welcoming to folks and open for them to come into that space. So for me, I know like I had my letter from Kim, you know, you had folks like BB in, in public relations. You had people who sort of reached out and pulled you in. Like my first exec position, I didn't run for anything my second year because I was like, eh, I got other stuff to do. I was like an RA that year and I was like, I need to focus on that. Then I got pulled into, uh, they didn't elect anyone for public service director. Mm -hmm. Because the, the joy of the election process, uh, <laughs> which again, hindsight being 2020 was a process that I would probably need to have looked at where I really think that if someone's interested, even if they don't have some of the skills, you can develop them Yeah. or you put them in an interim position, give them the opportunity to sort of do this work. And if it doesn't work, then you let them know, sorry, this isn't working because we sure enough had a way to get rid of someone because uh, we had an impeachment my senior year which was fantastic. Oh, jeez. So, of course, you've gone through the 89 elections, right? Yes. So it was supposed to be confidential and no one could say anything. Uh, we're trapped in this room all day, basically airing out grievances yeah. about an individual candidate. And you have the people who love them and the people who hate them going at it for however long. And God forbid if you're on the exec at the time, uh, because they send you out yes. and you're just sitting in the hallway or wherever waiting for your fate to be decided and then to come back in and be told, oh, by the way, you got a position. Great. Happiest person in the world. Or you did not get the position or we have no confidence in you. Yeah. And, and let's just say the amount of relationships that were damaged over that process over the time that I was there is definitely something that needed to be sort of addressed. You had everything in there. You had racism, you had sexism. Uh, I probably had some homophobia in there. You had, uh, you name it. It sort of went on with that process. And it was just a tough, tough sort of situation to be in. And God forbid, again, that you participated in, and things didn't go the way that you were hoping or the way they should have gone for you. Especially because, you know, a lot of folks have given blood, sweat, tears yeah. to the station, given up breaks, lost relationships, gained relationships, you know, all of that time and energy that's spent in the station. And, you know, just wanting to have your chance to give back, give back to the station and not to be able to do that was always hard. And there were a lot of people who could have been on, you know, exec or senior staff who didn't get an opportunity. And a number of times folks got on who didn't need to or because they were the one who ran for a position that nobody else wanted and was sort of space fillers. So there was a lot of that. But again, that's what happens in organizations. And depending on how strong your, your bylaws or your structures or your other ways to intervene, which we didn't really have, you know, I think led to a lot of the trouble that we had both then and then later on with it. But really looking back now, it's like, give somebody a chance, train them, develop them. That's what the station is for. We 
act like a professional station, but we're not there yet. This is the place for people to learn that um, and really making sure that you give them that opportunity and to have someone who's in there to help them to do that would have been helpful. Although at that point, you really couldn't tell us anything. Well, yeah, we're 1920 years old. We know everything. We know everything, but I don't think we would have benefited from working with our student, um, like with student organization training, with leadership development, all of those things that probably should have been a little bit more in place that never were, because again, we sort of kept passing things down and we were doing well. Uh, so nobody brings that stuff in until it becomes a problem. And I think a lot of that probably came to a head sort of in, yeah, I think Dean sort of got the short end of the stick on that one. Uh, so that sort of came to a head with her. So her and Harry, right? Yeah, Dean and Harry, yep. During Dean and Harry's term, that's sort of one to fall out from the pulse. Yeah. And the rebuilding from there. Because then again, you lost a lot of history and a lot of things that were sort of left exposed. And I think if there was a little bit more sensitivity to like who's in our leadership, how is that reflected? I mean, I think up to that point, we had only maybe had one female GM, uh, maybe one GM who had been of color, mm -hmm. maybe, and not really being cognizant of those things at that time or what that means for the station. The importance of the specialty shows, like how do you keep those going? Like even when we were moving to the Pulse, there were still blocks of time that had historically belonged to different genres of music. Yes. And sort of trying to keep those going. And what happens if those are not there? Even if that's not what your station is all the rest of the time, you know, for that experience, for the students to be able to do that. You want to make sure that you have those opportunities. You want to make sure that we can grow. Now, of course, you also have the opportunity to make the mistake. And we had that and learn from that and then keep going. So. All right. We'll leave it there. Cafe Like Elfani, class of 96. Appreciate your insight and your time today. Excellent. The WJPZ at 50 podcast is created entirely by the staff and alumni of the world's greatest media classroom. It's hosted by John Jag Gay, class of 2002. Editing help from James Bames Grundy III, class of 2020. Imaging by Maureen Cooper, class of 1999. And Ed Lacombe, class of 1985. Podcast artwork by Marty Dundix, class of 2001. Follow WJPZ at 50 on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you're listening right now.